All right, how's everyone doing? Is it good today? How many of you, let's just be honest, can we, can we be honest for just a moment together? How many of you are super excited for uh, lunch today? Okay. I see there's a few honest people in the house, okay? Listen, I love Easter. I love the celebration we have, the, the resurrection of Jesus. I love the traditions that surround Easter, the things we do together to have fun as family. I love family. I love food. And I was going to say this morning, I love funny hats. Um, I don't really see many Easter hats this morning, though. It's not really, I've mean, noticed my time living in South Dakota is not as big a deal. When I was a small child uh, living in North and South Carolina, all the ladies had hats. Easter, and uh, told honestly, I made fun of them. <laughs> Am I supposed to say that on Easter Sunday? And my mom's here today. That's even worse. Um, I mean, my mom made me wear a bow tie when I was a little kid. <coughs> Tell them, your mom. Um, I don't know. I love this day when we can celebrate together. I want to ask you another honest question. You don't have to answer it this morning. I am. I promise you, going somewhere with this. But I want you to think about something today. Big question this morning, why are you here? Think about it, just for a moment, why are you here? We're gonna to get to ultimately the big why today, like the ultimate why that led us all to this place, but really just not, not the big theological question, not because Jesus was risen from the grave, none of those things, why are you sitting in this seat, in this place today? Now, the answers in this room are gonna vary. Some of you, some of you listen, you're here because it's Easter, right? And you're like, I have to come at least twice a year. <laughs> Christmas and Easter. And some of you are like, why do you love Easter so much? Because I already know what the message is going to be about. I promise you, if you come other than Christmas and Easter, we'll vary it up a little bit. Right? <laughs> Make that deal for you. Some of you are here this morning. If you're being completely honest, you're here because someone made you come. Okay? Can I talk to you for a second? I promise you, just relax. It's going to be okay. Right? <laughs> We're almost done, and, and you're going to survive. But no, someone, someone said, listen, you come this morning, and I will buy, make, uh, buy your lunch, or I'll make you something. Maybe your mom said you had to come to church today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, all right? But somehow, someway, someone twisted your arm. Listen, if you're here today, and that's why, can I say, I'm glad you're here this morning to worship with us today. Maybe some of you are like, you know, what else would you do on Easter, right? It's the day I got to go to church. Some of you are here, you say, you know, mom didn't make me come, but I know it'd make her happy if I showed up today. Listen, however you found yourself here today, I'm going to ask you to, for the next few moments to consider something that we sang about earlier, something we celebrate today, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. And I want you to consider, has it made a difference in your life? Is it real? Can we trust it? Is it something that we can wrap our arms around? I read an article a little while ago, and it got me to thinking in this direction. And what I wanted to share with you today in terms of that, I want you to know from the very beginning, complete honesty, right? So we're kind of being kind of these honest moments. Some of you are like, yeah, I was forced to be here, or I'm here to keep someone happy, or hey, it's Easter, so I showed up. <laughs> Today, in that spirit of honesty, I want you to know something. I am going to ask you this morning to consider becoming a follower of Jesus despite all the objections you may have. Because listen, here's the deal. If you came here today because someone else wanted you to come, and listen, maybe some of you came, you know, because you're like, that's just what I do on Sundays. I grew up that way, so I show up, and this is my church, so this is where I'm at. But despite all of your objections, listen. Despite the pain that you've experienced, in spite of, can we be honest, in spite of some of the Christians you know, it's okay to laugh at that this morning, right? <laughs> the things you've went through, the, the, the twists and turns that life has taken, the times you've been disappointed with God and with those who claim His name, with all of those considered this morning, I'm going to challenge you to take a moment and consider the resurrection of Jesus. Because ultimately, the answer to the ultimate question of why we're here today is because nearly 2,000 years ago, a Jewish carpenter died on a cross for your sins. And had that been the end of the story, I promise you none of us would be here today. 
But on the first day of the week, they found an empty tomb. And because of that fact, that's ultimately why you're here today. Because the foundation of the Christian faith, listen, the foundation of the Christian faith is not Christians. How many of you say that's a good thing? Right? Yeah. Foundation of faith, because listen, we're flawed. I promise you this, if you attend this church long enough, I will disappoint you. That's a solemn promise I make everyone of you on this show. <laughs> I am human and I am flawed. But listen, we're going to worship Jesus together. We're going to go after Him together. The foundation of our Christian faith is not what Christians do or don't do, where they stand politically or don't stand politically. It's not about the questions we have answered. Or listen, how about this? The prayers we don't have answered. See, for a lot of us, we struggle because God doesn't answer prayer the way we want Him to answer it. And I can promise you, I'm in a long line of those that say, listen, I wanted God to do this, and He didn't do it the way that I wanted Him to do it. But I rest in the fact that I'm not God, and He is, and He understands things that I don't understand. I've been disappointed at times in the things that God has done, but that does not change the fact, first thing I put in your notes this morning, that the foundation of the Christian faith is a person. The foundation of the Christian faith is a person. This morning, his name is Jesus. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus is the answer to something that there is no other explanation for. I want to talk maybe for just a few moments to those of you in the room and say, Pastor, I'm here today, but I'm wrestling with some of the objections. You know, I've talked to people. I've had conversations. I went to university, and my professor brought up some really good things for me to consider. But can I have you consider something this morning? There is no good or reasonable explanation for the church. Let me say that again. There is no good, concrete, or reasonable explanation for the church. For one third of the world's population following Jesus, listen, you can look through movements, you can look through history, you can chart it out, and if you look at all of those factors, we should not be here today, and yet we are. From a very reasoned standpoint, the fact that you're sitting in a pew, even if you don't believe who Jesus is, is a miracle in and of itself. And it's evidence to the fact that the thing that we call the resurrection of Jesus really did happen. You say, Pastor, how do you get there? Millions of people today all around the world are celebrating, and I want you to think about this, they're celebrating a Jewish carpenter who lived roughly 2,000 years ago, who died in his early 30s, who only had a public ministry that lasted about three, three and a half years. He never traveled more than 30 miles from his home. He never wrote a book. He wasn't infinitely famous in his day. He had a relatively small sample of people that he ministered to, and yet today, this day, one third of the world's population will gather in his name to worship. Amen. Just, just think about it. Isn't that crazy? We have, we have very few recorded. We have what the gospel writers brought together. But when you start thinking of the actual quoted words of Jesus, that collection of things that Jesus himself said, we understand the Bible is spirit inspired, all those things. But when you think just from a purely study point, there are very few of the words of Jesus. Relative speaking, when you think of all the other religions in the world and things of people they brought up and the things that they record, and yet today, Christianity survives. And not only did it begin in this fledgling state, it was seen as a sect of Judaism that Jewish people itself desperately sought to snuff out. That's how we get to Jesus being crucified, ultimately, right? The Jewish people saw these people who eventually would call themselves the way, the followers of Christ. They saw them as something to be gotten rid of. Christianity came to its rise in one of the most difficult periods of human history. Nero was the emperor of Rome. Nero was a vicious man. A man who tortured Christians. Crucified Christians who hung them on spikes and lit them on fire alive in his garden to light it at night. Caesar Augustus, some of you know that name. Most of you only know that name in terms of the Christmas story. Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, who made Rome and 
Roman Empire who reigned 40 years, yet outside of historians and history books, he is mentioned every Christmas as a footnote to this Jewish carpenter named Jesus. I mean, think about that for a moment. Think about the unlikelihood. Even more than that, let me give you another, just another thought. I want you to think just for a few moments this morning. You say, Pastor, where are you going with this? We have to come to grips with the resurrection of Jesus. Because the reality is, if Jesus is truly the Son of God, if He really died in my place and He's resurrected, then He is worth serving. If He's not, we're wasting our time. But I submit to you this morning, you were here because Jesus truly was risen from the grave. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. These group of people would have long left all that happened. Even more crazy than that, let me give you another thought this morning. Did you know that for over 300 years following Jesus, there was no New Testament? Over 300 years. There were letters circulated, but they weren't bound together as we understand it today. People were discipled in small groups and through teaching. <laughs> letters were circulated. I just, how did you survive? The only explanation is that it's a miraculous, supernatural thing that God did to the risen Savior. It's the only explanation. Because we look at history, and all throughout history we see movements. Movements are powerful things. You can probably think of one off of the top of your head this morning. A charismatic leader rises to power. Generally a fairly prolific speaker with a new message that speaks to culture and addresses an issue. This person captures the attention of the people around them. Often when this person dies, the followers pick up the burden of leadership and they keep alive their teaching. We can count out a lot of people in history like this. One of my favorites is a guy by the name of William Wilberforce. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you haven't. There was a movie about his life. He fought for the abolition of slavery in England in the early, in the early 1800s. Long before the civil rights movement here in America. He died shortly after seeing the thing he had fought for passed. But it inspired others the same cause. Another name that many, many of you are much more familiar with, Martin Luther King Jr., <coughs> founder of the Civil Rights Movement, one of the most profound people in that movement anyway, has called for peaceful protest. Even after being shot in 1968, others picked up his call and the movement continued. We understand how that works. We understand what that looks like. But can I tell you something this morning? That's not what happened with Christianity. In fact, when you read the text, you would think, well, maybe that is what happened. But listen, that's not what happened at all. His disciples were devastated. Give your Bibles here to John chapter 20. We're going to get there in just a moment. We're also going to be over in 1 Corinthians as well this morning. But when you read the totality of the gospel story, the disciples were devastated. Many of them even returning to their previous jobs. We see them out fishing and other activities. They thought it was over. We'll see it even this morning. Even after seeing the empty tomb, they didn't even realize at that point that he had been resurrected. It wasn't until after Jesus revealed himself to them that the reality of the resurrection became apparent to them. You say, Pastor, how did this happen? Why was this all? Listen. The problem with Jesus is this. The first thing I put in your notes is the problem was who Jesus wasn't. How did they miss this? After all that Jesus said, the problem is who he wasn't. He wasn't just another leader. Listen, Jesus didn't advocate revolution or overthrowing Rome. He wasn't trying to inspire a movement. His message, listen, his message wasn't even unique. His teachings on love are based on the Old Testament. His messages weren't necessarily even appealing. Jesus talked about things like denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Him. He encouraged people to love their enemies and pay their taxes. Not an overly popular message. Listen, Jesus wasn't the thing that they thought they were looking for. He followed Jewish laws and Jewish customs. 
Another problem with Jesus, the other problem was Jesus' message was centered on, well, Jesus. For those who weren't sure of this whole Messiah thing or that he was the one, that was a turnoff to them. He never told, listen, he never told the disciples to trust in an idea. Every movement is about trusting in an idea. Listen, why is Christianity different? Why are you here today? Because Jesus really was risen from the grave. Because it wasn't about an idea, it was about a person. He said, trust in me. Jesus to the to Lazarus' sisters in John 11 said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Later on, Jesus talking to the apostles. In John 14, he says, anyone who has seen the Father has seen, or excuse me, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So I submit to you this morning, why did Christianity survive? I truly believe the only thing we can come back to is it wasn't about something, it was about someone, and that someone is Jesus. John chapter 20. John 20. We're into verse 9 verses. It says this, Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. The other gospel writers fill in a few blanks for us. They tell us that the women were going to apply some spices and things at the tomb. Not one of the Gospels let us know that it was an angel of the Lord that removed the tomb, or excuse me, removed the stone from the entrance of the tomb. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So think about what she just said there for just a moment. Isn't that kind of a weird thing to say? Think about it, right? Jesus had taught them all the things he taught them. He had, he had been kind of giving them words. He talked about the resurrection. And her response is, they took the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. I want you to understand something. When you read the gospel writers, it had not dawned on them yet of the resurrection. There wasn't a realization. There's also something really weird happening here. In all the gospel accounts, the very first people to discover the empty tomb were all women. In fact, Luke says this in Luke 24, 11, talking about this moment when the women come back to them. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. I'm not saying this is right, but this was just a fact of the time. In this time period, like, here's a great, another thing I want you to think about. The gospel writers, if they were trying to pull off the greatest hoax of all time, they did it all wrong. They don't paint themselves as the heroes of the story. They paint themselves as cowards, as people who turned back, as people who ran when Jesus was taken and arrested. Listen, if you're wanting to propagate a fraud, you make yourself look good. They, they leave no doubt that they were mystified by this thing that was happening until Jesus appeared to them. Not only that, they write in the text, in the Gospels, in the Gospel account, that the people who discovered Jesus' empty tomb were women. They said, well, Pastor, why does that matter? Well, in their time period, in their history, like I said, doesn't, it's not right. I was saying it's right, but listen, here's the fact. A woman could not testify in court because her testimony was considered null and void just because she was a woman. So if you're wanting to build a case... The last thing you would want to write and tell people about is that the person who discovered the empty tomb was a woman. It doesn't make sense. You'd want it to be the men so that their testimony could be held up in court and it would be believed. You say, Pastor, why did you do that? Because I think God understands something that, that we need to understand. He's not confound to human thinking or human reasoning. He appeared to those women on purpose. He wanted them to be the first ones there. He wanted them to have that realization. Verse 3, John 20. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Verse 6. And then Simon Peter, Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Typical Peter, right? Headlong first. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth that was still 
in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, the one who had reached the tomb first, went inside. He saw and believed. And in case you're wondering what he believed, the writer of John lets us know he believed what? He believed ultimately that the tomb was empty. So how do you know that? Well, verse 9 tells us, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Listen, in this moment, if you read the totality of all the gospel accounts, each one written for a different purpose to a different audience, but when you bring them together, it wasn't until Jesus appeared to them, the, the, the risen Savior before His ascension, that they got it. They understood it. And listen, it changed everything. It changed the message. It changed the way they talk. It changed what they did. It changed their approach to the people around them. It changed how they loved and interacted with each other. It sparked a revolution that took Peter from someone who was timid and a denier of Christ to someone who stood up on the day of Pentecost and boldly proclaimed who Jesus was. And their message is even more interesting. If you read the God, it's crazy what happens after, after this moment. Once they see Jesus, the day of Pentecost happens, they travel around. And here's really their message. They look at people and say, listen, you killed Jesus. But guess what? He didn't stay dead. He's alive. Believe in him. Their message became very centered on the person of Jesus Christ. Not just his parables and his teachings, but specifically the person of Jesus. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. It'll be on the screen. You can turn there. You're going to read the first eight verses in verses 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians 15 says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have no belief. See, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. As Paul writing here in 1 Corinthians 1 says, this is the most important thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. The implication here is that Paul said, listen, if you don't believe me, I'm not the only witness to this. There are others, go talk to them. Then he appeared to James and then all the apostles. And, the la and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And speaking of his road to Emmaus experience, verse 12. But if, it is, <clears throat> but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. All that we do, the reason you're here today, hangs on this one central thing, the resurrected Savior. You are here today because they saw a resurrected Jesus. Amen. That's why you're here today. Nothing else makes sense. Why would these people sacrifice for just an idea that we don't even know that they totally understand? Why would Christianity sustain a post-Christ? All the things that happened. This, this Jewish sect of people who rose out of this really small area. None of it makes sense from a historical perspective. Jesus' teachings weren't overly appealing. And yet, here we are today. Some of you are here because you were invited or you were brought, but I believe the purpose is more significant. You're here today to consider a question. What will you do with the resurrection of Jesus? Listen, if you know Him today and you're a Christ follower, you're a part of the already convinced crowd. You're here to have a good Sunday where you're worshiping and all those things together. Listen, we need to live in the reality of the resurrection every day. 
Easter is not one day a year. It is every moment of the year. We serve a resurrected Savior and it should inform the decisions we make. It should shape how we treat our family, how we, how we engage our spouses, how we parent, how we run our businesses, and how we work. Listen, we should be the hardest workers out there. Why? Because of who Jesus is. Because we serve the resurrected Savior. Jesus' followers didn't re-engage because of something that he taught. They re-engaged after the, the death of Jesus because they saw him risen. Man, it's good news today. Yes. It excites me because I don't, listen, I don't serve a dead religion. I don't serve some guy that died and left me some of his teachings. I don't serve an idea. I serve a person. His name is Jesus. And it's good news today. Christianity is fundamentally different. Because of a call to believe in someone. To believe in Jesus. The message of the early church was Jesus and Him resurrected. Luke, who carefully recorded the events, explained kind of what happened next. Jesus' followers went into the streets. They began to proclaim not just love one another, not the parables, not to be blessed, but they proclaimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. You can read it all throughout Scripture in the book of Acts. In fact, here's one of the quotes from Peter. Peter says, listen, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. What shall we do? The book of Acts is full of these moments. Acts 3.15. See, another quote from this moment it says this. You killed the author of life, but God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. We saw it happen. We know that it happened. And Peter replied to a group that said, responded to that question in Acts 2 and said, What should we do? In Acts 2, his reply is simply this Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin. The resurrection is the only explanation to why you're here today, it's the only reason the church has survived. Because listen, the church is flawed. The people in the church is flawed. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection of Jesus punctuated the point of the crucifixion. I want you to think about something today because some of you are still wrestling. You say, Pastor, but I've still experienced the pain and the loss and the suffering and the difficulties and the unanswered prayer. And I want you to know something today. Yes, you have. But also understand something today. God sent His only Son, Jesus, into this existence to experience what we experience. Jesus is fully God and fully man, which is something that makes my brain hurt sometimes to think about. But He limited His divinity while He was here, and He experienced pain and temptation and suffering, yet He remained sinless. You say, why did He do that? Because He wanted to experience our pain, and He wanted to experience our failure, and He wanted to be able to identify with us. And then He was killed it's, our sin was laid upon him. He was raised on the third day. Why? To prove that he could do something about your pain and your fear. Listen, he's the answer you've been looking for today. He's the answer. He didn't just come to identify with us. He came to say, listen, I can conquer it. I'm the answer if you'll simply give yourself to me. So if you're a Christian this morning, you're in this room, I want to encourage you to live with confidence. Your prayers matter, your faithfulness matters, your serving matters, your generosity matters. I'm going to invite our worship team to come join me this morning. If you're not a Christian in this room, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then can I encourage you, there is no greater response to the resurrected Jesus than a life sacrifice to Him. God's word is very clear. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, the scriptures say you will be saved. But there's something that we have to do. We have to submit our heart. We have to be willing to say, you know what? I am a sinner. I'll tell you something this morning. I'm a sinner. I need to saved. I had to say that same prayer. I had to come to that same place that simply says this. I want to do it all for myself. I want to be self-dependent and self-reliant. But there's just something that I can't do, and that's attain heaven on my own. 
I make a mess of this life every time I try to do it on my own. So church, I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. I tried to be as honest as I could with you this morning. I tried to establish for you a, even a historical reason why the church survived. But I told you from the very beginning, my ultimate goal this morning was that every person in this room would identify with and proclaim Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Here's how we're going to end service. This moment, I'm going to ask those of you in this room to say, you know, Pastor, I've come to church for a long time, or maybe someone drugged me here today, or Mama promised me pie. <laughs> and yet today, God did something in my heart. I'm going to ask you today, just a moment, to raise a hand and say, that's me, I need, to, I need to receive Christ. And we want to connect with you and help you in that relationship with Him. Listen, if you're in here and you already know Him, I'm going to encourage you, man, go after Him. Discover what He's called you to do. Serve and be a part of His kingdom. But here's how we're going to close service. I'm going to ask a couple questions. I'm going to have you pray. When we're done, I'm going to pray a prayer corporately. And then a worship team, we thought it would be fun this Easter Sunday to have a last worship song together. We'll worship. That will let you know when, uh, when you can get out of here. I'm glad you've been here to worship with us today. If you have questions, always let, always let you can ask us. As worship is ending up, I, I know something to be true today. There's some of you in this room who say, Pastor, I'm hurting. i got stuff going on. And so some of our prayer team will make themselves available at the end of that time of worship. And you want someone to pray with you today, to join their faith with yours. Listen, we do this out of obedience to God's Word. It tells us to, to call for the elders of church and they'll anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And the Scripture says it's powerful and effective. So we want to provide time for that today as well. But would you just in this moment, would you just close your eyes for just a second? I want everyone in this room to ask themselves just simply this question. Have I truly committed my life fully to Jesus? Listen, I know it sounds too simple to be true that all that's required is me to say that I'm sorry for my sin. To ask Jesus to come into my life and to be the ruler and author of my life. Listen this morning, there's, there's more to it than that. You see, it requires the Holy Spirit to convict, which I believe He's doing right now, and if you respond today, it's in response to that conviction. But you're also saying, listen, I'm no longer first place, Jesus, you are. And I'm willing to do the things you call me to do. Will you walk out of here today? Perfect no, but I promise you this, you'll walk out of here today different. And you will have applied to you the perfection of Jesus. So right now, as you're kind of praying, believers in the room, listen, this is your opportunity just to pray for a moment. You say, Pastor, I've never done that before, but I need to. Right now, your heart may be beating, palms might be sweating, you might feel a little nervous on the end, say, Pastor, what's that? Listen, that's the Holy Spirit. Just kind of tapping you on the shoulder. Despite your objections, despite your pain, despite what you've been through, you say, listen, today is the day. You're not here by accident. And I've got my hand on you. So if that's you, would you just simply raise up hand and say, Pastor, it's, that's me today. I need to know Jesus. Is there anyone? I just want a chance to pray with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? You can put your hands back down. I just want to join these two say, today's my day. Give about another 10 seconds. I'm not going to make a long time out of this. Because listen, this isn't about me manipulating you. This is about you responding to the Holy Spirit today. One last thing, anyone else say, today's my day, Pastor. I'm going to ask if you would just simply repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you sending your son. Send your son. Thank, you Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. And Jesus, I'm asking you today to forgive me of my sin. To come into my life. To change me. I give control to you.
this room. God, I pray that we would live in the reality of the resurrection. God, we thank you for what you did. And Lord, now we turn and we celebrate what that means. God, as we go from this place, we go as people live in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you gave your life to Christ today, I want to encourage you to tell someone they need to know. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, God is working on me, but I don't know about that whole thing yet. Talk to someone. Talk to the one who brought you today. Hey, would you worship with us as we prepare to leave today?